Hey you guys, this is Rex Branson here. And um, years ago, I used to shoot a series called Wood Carver's Corner. And since I've been posting a few things online, I had a lot of requests to go back to trying to teach some wood carving again. So I thought, you know, if we're going to start Wood Carver's Corner all over again, which is our idea here, that we would kind of start with something really, really simple. And then we'll start working up each time we do a Wood Carver's Corner. And so what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about driftwood type things. And when I first started carving, I done a lot of uh, just picking up wood somewhere and doing driftwood. And I'll just show you a few different examples. For instance, today, the simple thing we're going to do is just a real simple eagle head where you're using the driftwood itself as uh, kind of how it's flowing out the back. Now I've cut out, what I've done is taken a, a piece of driftwood like this right here. And of course this was a root of a tree so I cut off the part. I just picked this up out on the beach and I'll get on the bandsaw and I'll flatten the back where it'll hang on the wall which is like this when I got my hand. See it's uh, of course this got wet because it's snowing outside and uh, I drew my pattern on here and then I bandsawed it. But let's say you're going to do a bigger one or something. You could actually draw your pattern on and cut around it with a chainsaw, which I've done if you're doing bigger ones. So I just wanted to show you a few things. For instance, here's a horse head, which we probably will be doing in the next episode of Woodcarver's Corner. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of driftwood type stuff at first. Now this is a red cedar, and red cedar doesn't um, carve very well. This, this stuff is splintery, it doesn't carve worth a darn. But uh, I like the color, as you can see when you're done, it, it's got a beautiful color. But here's a horse head done out of driftwood. And I, I like this because you can just find the wood somewhere. Uh, I'll show you this guy here. Um, this is actually a pine knot and years ago when I was down in uh, northern Arizona along the rim by Flagstaff there's tons of these pine knots like this and uh, gosh I must have carved 50 of these different guys like this with a hat and stuff here again this pine knots if you've ever tried to carve a pine knot these things are hard man they don't carve very well and so I got to where I would use a Dremel tool to carve some of it and then I would go back in later on with hand tools and, and finish it up. Um, I've done a lot of different things with driftwood. This is just a little grape guy with some grape leaves. Uh, here again, this is red cedar. The reason I've got so much red cedar stuff is back when I lived in Oklahoma, one of my favorite days was to uh, go out with the canoe or in a boat, you know, and uh, just spend the day collecting driftwood. And so I'm still to this, here we are 20, 25 years later, I am still carving some of that same driftwood. But like here's a little wine guy here. Uh, I have another one here, a uh, wine guy where I've carved some grapes and done a, uh, using the roots up here. But notice here how I've drilled through this. So it's a wine bottle holder and it hangs on the wall like in your wine room or wherever and you put a bottle of wine back there. So anyway, without wasting too much of our time today, Let's talk about our project here. Is let me draw the pattern right quick for you. 
very simple pattern. Let's just say that the driftwood is flowing however it's flowing here. You know, could be anything. But all I'm going to do is cut an eagle head in this. Get his beak coming around here. Now this beak can be shaped various ways. Some of these guys I call a thunderbird more than I do an eagle or something. But this is your basic pattern of the head and you got the brow going here. And what I'll do, a lot of times I'll bandsaw this out. And then all we're going to do is make a little hollowing in here like this. We're going to put an eye here and we're just simply going to put a, a beak and a mouth and a lot of times I'll do a little secondary thing here where you put a little kind of a nostril thing in there. This is basically our pattern. The only thing I may do later on is I may throw a couple of little V-tooling things in here. You know, not to get too carried away. I try to let the actual wood, the drift part of the wood do, say what it's going to say, you know. So, anyway, that's basically the pattern, you guys. I'll set that back there. And, uh... Here's one. I just went out to the bandsaw just a minute ago. That's why it's still a little wet because it's snowing outside out there right now. Um, but you can see that I cut that pattern with the bandsaw. And of course I flattened the back where it would hang on the wall. And uh, all I'm simply going to do is round this up a little bit with a carving tool and then put the eye and the stuff that I just drew on our pattern. Um, and see, your driftwood could be doing a lot of different things. This kind of gives the look of a wing in a way, and the way this flows down, and even this little thing here, kind of works, you know what I'm saying. This kind of works. But that's what I love about driftwood is every one, here's another one, Every one you do turns out so differently. Now, you, I'm using red cedar here because that's what there was a lot of where I was picking up driftwood. But you guys can use any kind of driftwood that'll carve well. So anyway, en enough about uh, the driftwood itself. And I'll uh, actually get started here and give you guys a little bit of an idea now this wood's hard enough that I'm going to have to probably use a mallet to uh, carve with here. This is a number three flat gouge. Pretty much stay with it for cleaning off and rounding up. And then I'm going to go to just a U gouge and a V tool. It's about the only things on this simple little project. Now I haven't used this vise in a while. And I do have a couple of screws in the back, so I'll have to watch out and not hit my screws. And when you're first tasting your wood, you guys, this is hard. You can see this wood pretty darn hard, right? And you'll also notice that with driftwood, see a big old chunk might come out of there or something. So sometimes you can carve going, you notice I'm going with the grain this way at first. Because it's carving okay going that way. But if I turn around and go this way, this it's going to try to dig way in, you know. So what you'll have to do with your piece of driftwood is mess with it one way or the other to see how it's going to carve. Because I don't know how many times I've been going along there and all of a sudden it'll dig in a big old chunk. So you're just, I, I call it tasting the wood. You're, you're tasting it here. And I know my hands are probably in the way here, but you'll just have to bear with me. All I'm doing is rounding up, um, getting a feel for the wood. 
What I've done is just simply rounded some stuff off. I'll pull this out of the vise right quick and kind of show you. I did a slight bit of rounding on the, the back side, not much. Where This is all against the wall anyway back here. But uh, I rounded over here, rounded the beak over, and I brought it down. But look, I did not go to a real fine peak on that beak yet. Because that's the most vulnerable part. And uh, I'll probably take my knife and do a little bit of whittling right here at the very end around that beak. But I'll just show you where, where I'm going to next. Um... <clears throat> I'm going to take a V-tool and I'm going to make a little bit of a, let's call it a brow line here. I'm going to make a V-tool there. Then I'm going to take a round gouge and I'm going to make an eye right here. That's kind of my first couple of things. Um, to me, that eye looks a little bit too far back. So as an, and you know, I'm using a Sharpie right now, you guys, but actually a pencil of some sort is probably better. Uh, if you use a Sharpie when you're in close, that ink might soak into your project and you might have to whittle it out. But like here, I need to erase that eye and move it forward some. So I would just erase it with the flat gouge like this, see? And then uh, just move it forward a little bit more. I didn't like quite where I had it. That's a little further forward. I might even move it a little more forward as I'm cutting it in there. Now let's just talk a minute about tools. Um, I've only got about four or five tools laid out over here. Here's the flat gouge that I'm using. Now, here's what I always tell people when they first start carving. You don't need a set of tools. Because in a set, you end up getting three or four tools in a set that you never use. In other words, they'll give you just a real flat gouge. Looks almost like a screwdriver, you know. And then they'll give you a skew cut, which is an angled cut. Now, if you're doing chip carving or something, those are tools that you might use. But I could carve this with three tools. Flat gouge, this U gouge that I got right here. The reason I got this U gouge, look here. It's going to fit the contour of my eye upside down, right? So here in a minute, when I get ready to pop that eye in there, I'm just going to use this upside down and put that eye right in there. The other tools, now you don't need three V tools either. But the reason, if you've done much carving, you know why I've got three V tools here. Because one of these probably is duller or sharper than the others. And so I got a small V for the beak here when I get ready to put this beak in. Let me go ahead and draw the rest of the pattern. Oh, finish talking about the V-tools first. Is <laughs> These are about the same size V-tool, but one of these obviously is sharper than the other one. And usually, if your V-tools are like mine, uh, you're going to have to try to find which one's the sharpest to do the job with. So, um, a V-tool, a couple of different sizes, and of course your carving knife. And this carving knife is not very sharp. It actually has Joe written on there, which is my dad, which has been dead for 20 years or more, 23 years now. But I still got some of his carving tools and I use them from time to time. So um, I'm going to draw the rest of our pattern on here, you guys, right quick. There's this mouth. I usually start back here about the back of the eye. And I bring it like this, a little bit of uh, arc to it. And then I'm going to bring it around to this peak right here. Now, 
you've all heard the old saying, does a chicken have lips? Well, kind of does. I'll do a little, starting in here, I'll do a secondary around this mouth cut, like here and here. So you do end up putting kind of some lips on there. I will take some of this out of here, down in here, in a little bit too, to pull that beak in and under there. And then when I'm creating this brow, I'll end up with a couple of lines here on that brow. And that's where that little breathing hole is going to go. And so that's basically our pattern on there. We'll see which one of these V-tools is sharp enough to cut. <laughs> now I'm going around this eye with this V-tool, you guys. Look here. You don't have to be using a mouth. I could be just pushing this V-tool. But this hand has been giving me trouble lately. And if I go gripping on this stuff very much and pushing on it, my hand gets to kind of hurt me. So I find it simpler just to use a mallet and bump. You know, I'm, I'm not getting after it real hard here. I'm just bumping it. But see, I got me a place for my eye and I got my V-tool in there. And I'm going to take this tool upside down, this round one I showed you. I need to tighten my vice up a little. Things were moving on me here. And I got the natural roundness of that gouge working for me. And I can come right back and clean it up against itself. I guess I'd be better off hand carving here now. So I'm going to round this um, eye up. And if you take your time, I'm not liking how this vice is trying to move on me. So see, I'm using the natural roundness of that gouge to round that eye up. And yes, I will pull some of this surrounding area down. Let's hope whatever wood you guys at home are using it's softer than this because you can tell by watching me here this wood is hard it's really hard uh, but then again look at the natural beauty of that wood it is gorgeous piece of cedar red cedar all right i'm going back to my v-tool here and i'm going to v-tool this line just slightly up and over. Don't get too deep coming over your beak or you'll pull a big old piece chunk off there. You'll learn to take it easy with stuff the more you... <laughs> I always tell everybody, you know, you actually learn more from your mistakes than you do from getting it right the first time. In other words, if you pull a big old chunk of wood off that you didn't mean to pull off, well, the next time you go at it, you're like, oh, don't do that, because last time I messed it up, you know. <laughs> with, with, especially with wood carving, that's how you learn. Now, uh, I'm going to V-tool not only the mouth, but around the lips a little bit, too, here. Um, I might even be better to reposition my guy. In other words, I'm... Let's put him this way. I think would be a better angle for the way this wood is trying to do me here. And my vice and everything's moving around on me. But, all right, I'm gonna do his lip a little. And then, this is actual mouth cut. Now look here, when I get to the end, I'm just going to try to bring it around in a circle. Because you will break that, you'll break that beak right off there if you're not just really careful, you guys. 
And like I said, most people probably would not be using a mallet. But then again, you have to develop the way you like to carve. Uh, I have always carved with a mallet. And you know, I hardly ever did back when I first started carving. And I'll tell you who I watched one time years ago doing a demonstration. Well, some of you guys, if you're watching, you might remember old John Burks from up in Ithaca, Nebraska. Well, old John, he was the first guy I ever seen that hardly ever touched pushing the tools by hand. I mean, that guy, he, he smacked everything in with a mallet and he just blew my mind the first time that I ever watched John carve. Uh, he, he was a very big influence on me back, God, this been 30 years ago or more. Uh, I helped him one time teach at the War Eagle Seminar down at War Eagle, Arkansas. And, uh, Anyway, John was a big influence of mine. I'll tell you, I'm starting to thin this lower beak up here while I'm BSing you guys a little. But I'll tell you who else was one of the biggest influences for me, and probably you guys too, was Harold Enlock. Uh, I've known Harold, gosh, for 30, 35 years or more. Uh, and then... Uh, Dean Troutman was a big influence for me. Stu Martin. I carved with all those guys over the years uh, at seminars or at places I was teaching. They would be teaching. So we've been at it a while. <clears throat> Notice I'm, I'm rounding my beak up. I'm trimming up around where I've done my V-tooling for the lips. I'm thinning up a little here underneath. Now, if you're in here messing around, watch out, because you go very hard, you'll pop the end of that beak right off there. So this is one of the areas you got to be really careful in there. And you could go to your knife about any time now and begin to... All I'm actually going to do here, you guys, is clean up around my eye, around my eye just a little bit more, clean some of this up, and I'm going to... Uh, around his beak just a slight bit more with a knife. You see how this wood is so hard and you can see how shiny it is when you cut it. It's really a hard piece of wood. But uh, I'm going to do a little here under this beak. Now here you got to be careful. You'll pop the end of that beak right off there. There's times when I get this almost done on this beak that I will actually soak the bottom of this beak with a little bit of super glue to help hold it, <clears throat> you know. Um, but anyway, see I got my knife and I'm sharpening the beak a little bit. It don't have to be sharp, sharp. And I'm going to take a little bit more off in here. Now, if you guys' this piece of wood is carving real good by hand, you, you don't have to use a mallet. You could be doing this all by hand. But, like I said, this piece of wood is just so hard that you almost have to use a mallet to carve it. So, all I'm going to do to finish up here, you guys, I'm going to round this eye up, do a little bit of trimming around here, cleaning up, and I may throw a few feather marks with a V-tool here. Uh, I'll give you just a quick example of what I'm saying. Um, I'll do a couple of them right quick for you here. Now you could do, in other words, I tell my students, I say salt and pepper to taste. In other words, if, if a couple of these looks real good, well then put a couple more. But sometimes <clears throat> too many is too many. A little looks good, but too many is too much. 
So you'll just have to salt and pepper this to taste. Uh, you could get carried away here, you know, but you're just making a few feather looking marks here. Now, if you really wanted to do a real, real nice one, you could sit there and do the paintings on the feathers, stuff like that. And I'll talk to you guys here in a minute about what I would put on here for finish. But that's basically the pattern. I will clean up my, I got a couple of pencil marks and stuff on there. And I will round my eye up a little nicer. But other than that, you guys, that's basically it on this simple little uh, eagle head project. Now, I got some 220 sandpaper here, and I like to have it where it's practically wore out. Sometimes instead of brand new sandpaper, I'll take and wad it and unwad it and wad it and unwad it a few times. Because I don't want it on a hard wood like this. If I went on there with, let's say, 180 or 150, it was going to leave scratch marks in this hard wood. But uh, I may just give this thing just a real quick once over with this wore out 220. And like I told you guys before, the reason I love this little project is I don't have to match the mouth or the eyes or anything like that. We're just doing a simple, uh, more or less a relief carving. And uh, now on this uh, red cedar, I tell you, I've been using this wipe on poly quite a bit. And... Um, I like this because it brings, well, here's a piece of red cedar here that I've got it on. It brings a nice color to it and just a little bit of a sheen to it, you know. And it seems to work well and it's easy. Now, if you're using any kind of polyurethane, you guys, make sure that you get this stuff shook up really, really good. Because what will happen with polyurethane, if it's been setting for a long, long time, all of the drying agents will settle to the bottom of it. And sometimes it will end up uh, leaving a milky white uh, effect to your carving. So I always tell everybody, make sure to shake it good. And um, then I'm just going to paint um, some of this on there. I'm pretty much done with this simple little eagle project. A lot of times I don't like to put the finish on the actual driftwood part. Um, now here's a little piece of the cedar that I'd sawed off. And so I try not to get it so much on the um, actual driftwood because I kind of like that grayish color there. This is that wipe on poly. This is an older can. I prefer uh, a new can, but I haven't bought any in quite a while. And this is, I hope, still good. Now you might notice there's a little crack here on the beak. And if you let that polyurethane soak into that crack and dry, this stuff is like glue after it dries. It'll really harden the outside of your project. Now, you also have the option here. Uh, for instance, do I want to put it on the back? You know, And I find that the customers like it if I do the back. So, And you notice that I got my uh, hanger back here on the back so notice how that polyurethane brings out that really deep nice red color too you know um, of course you're not looking at the back but uh, it sure brings out a nice color to this red cedar 
Uh, if you guys carve much of that cottonwood bark like we do all the time, it really brings out a nice color with the cottonwood bark, too. So, anyway, I'm pretty much done here, you guys. Um, look at how it's really brought the color out in this piece. Now, I probably will um, let it soak in for just a second here. And then I'm going to kind of dry brush it, you might say. In other words, I'm wiping my brush out a little here. And I'm going to go over it one last time with a kind of a dry brush. I'm drying my brush off. Now, I, I hung a hanger on the back of here. And I already tried it on a place on the wall to see how it's going to hang. And oddly enough, this guy is heavy in the back, and he points up when you hang him on the wall. But you know what, you guys? I kind of like it. I'm going to take him over there and hang him on the wall, and I'm going to show you guys um, what he looks like. The next edition of Woodcarver's Corner... We're going to, I'm going to show you guys how to do a horse head. Just, it's a lot like the eagle we just done. They're good sellers, and I have carved a bunch of them over the years. So, I'll see you guys next time on Wood Carver's Corner.